Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. We're delighted to welcome you to our Zoom meeting, arranged by Liberal Voice for Women. We're a special interest group of Liberal Democrat members and supporters aiming to promote the interests of women and girls within our party. We've had a very busy autumn so far. We've been represented at our party conference, at Filia, and at the LGB Alliance conference. And we've been busy all doing all sorts of other things, meet, having meetings and making representations. So uh, this is just a, a quiet evening <laughs> um, when we're going to be looking at a particular issue. We're focusing in these meetings upon topics which we feel the Liberal Democrats need to understand and discuss openly. We feel it's clear that some of the party's current policies are not in the interests of girls and women. Old hands know this already, but for new participants, please put your questions in the chat as we go along and I'll call on you to ask them at the end. Do bear in mind that we're recording this event and we'll be sharing the recording on YouTube afterwards. So please indicate when you write your question, whether you'd like to ask it yourself or prefer that I read it out for you. I suggest that you put your Zoom screen on speaker view for the best view of the discussion and get ready to hear a really fascinating and enlightening writer. Now, let me introduce you to our speaker. Dr. Helen Joyce is a mathematician by training, first at Trinity College Dublin, then Cambridge, and then at UCL, and was later founding editor of the magazine of the Royal Statistical Society. Since 2005, Helen has worked for the respected magazine, The Economist, currently as its Britain editor. Before we start, I think we must emphasise that in discussing your book, Helen, we're not seeking to denigrate uh, or talk about individual transgender people who are rightly entitled to the protected characteristic of gender reassignment and the enjoyment of peacefully going about their business and to whom we extend a compassionate understanding. Your thesis concerns instead the ideology which seeks to enforce upon people the primacy of a belief about gender and its self-identification, which most people do not share, referring to rely upon immutable, evolved, biological, legal sex. So, having said that, um, let me get on to uh, looking at this fantastic book. Uh, what I want to know, first of all, is what made you have to write this book? Well, I started in uh, looking at it as a journalist, just as any other of the hun hundreds and hundreds of stories about which I knew nothing when I started. And I quite quickly realized that there was something very strange here, which was that the reaction of people to getting a call from somebody at The Economist saying, I'm thinking about writing about this legal change or this social issue or you know, this political matter or whatever, wasn't the usual response. Like the usual response, I mean, people can say, I don't want to talk about it or I can't, but they never ever say to you, you Nazi. You know, it's never, um, you know, this is something that's completely unacceptable to talk about and you mustn't ask about it. And that's what happened in effect with this. And then the second thing that struck me as very odd was the extraordinary level of speech policing in any discussion I did manage to have. Like, you know, I've had to write about things that I'm not an expert in when I was a foreign correspondent, especially uh, in Brazil, because you're the only person you have to write everything. You've got to write about economics and politics and business and whatever. And very often your interview is very educational. You're having to um, ask questions maybe in the wrong words and your interviewee will explain to you, oh, no, that's not right. It's like this. Da, da, da. And then they get on with it. But with this, like getting the words wrong was a major crime. And I couldn't understand the answers I was being given because the, the words were so weird. So I knew there was something really serious here. And it took me a while to get my head around it. And when I did, I became quite outraged. The day that I became personally outraged, just in my head, you know, was when I really finally realised that they seriously meant that um, sexual orientation was to be based on gender identity rather than on sex. And I mean, I'm a boring, straight, middle-aged woman in a happy marriage with two kids. And I just thought, this is absurd. I mean, nobody's actually going to insist on this for me, but I mean, my goodness, of course I'm only attracted to men. I mean, that's just the way I'm built. I can't help it. And it doesn't matter if a woman thinks of herself as a man, that's fine. I've no issue with that. But I'm not going to think of her as a man in terms of this most central thing to me. And then the last bit of it really was when I realized that it truly mattered and that it mattered in a way that meant that I couldn't avoid doing something about it. 
So I did spend some months wittering to myself about, you know, somebody should write a book about this. A book should be written about this. But should it be me? Well, I'd had, you know, a lot of difficulty getting pieces about it into um, news, in, into um, publications, like not just to The Economist, you know, people would say they were interested and they would drop it or they would try to rewrite it or other people would complain on the publication or whatever. And I did sort of realise that this might be something that would influence my job. Um, and I didn't want to do that. I had a rather nice job as the finance editor at The Economist at the time. So it was when I met detransitioners. It really was at a meeting of detransitioners in Manchester. I think it was October. It must have been October 2018. And I realised that it wasn't just that people meant that you had to at least theoretically be willing to sleep with somebody of the sex you don't find attractive if that if those people say certain things or believe certain things about themselves it was actually that children were being sterilized and i hadn't realized that in that visceral sense but at that meeting there were six or seven young lesbian women who had in varying degrees gone through um uh, had gone through medical transitions of one sort or another up to and including having everything removed by the time they were 21. Um, Alison, I'm noting that some of the questions are saying that everybody is just seeing the blank liberal voice for women's screen, and I am too as the speaker of you, so I don't know what that's about. If you go back to the gallery, you'll see all of us, everybody, but I don't know why. The... Yeah, okay, I can see you. All... Oh, yeah. Yeah. That let's brought stick... you back. <laughs> let's, let's stick with that for a bit then, shall we, if there's a little problem at... Okay, not to interrupt you, carry on. Yes, yeah, so it was really that, that, um, you know, at the point at which you realise that they are sterilising children, um, it's a moment of moral clarity that doesn't leave any space for uh, asking yourself if this is the right moment or if you are the right person or what will this do? Um, it, you know, I really that night decided I had to write a book and I did genuinely expect that I would have to self-publish it because I didn't think I'd get anywhere in the publishing industry. And indeed, it was actually very hard to get published. I did get dropped repeatedly. By people who said that they were interested in it and then discovered how much difficulty it would cause them in their own companies and you know just sort of fast forward a bit nobody was willing to pick up the audio rights i ended up recording it myself with the help of my son and um we didn't get any publisher to pick it up in the us so we're just distributing the british edition there so you know i wasn't wrong that it was going to be difficult to get it published what i was absolutely certain of was though <laughs> that there was a big appetite for hearing the story and a big need for it so once i could find someone brave enough to publish it it did really well yeah, you mentioned brave. I think it's remarkable that it should take bravery to, to publish a book. Um, your epigraph quotes Audre Lord. When I dare to be powerful, to use my strength in the service of my vision, then it becomes less and less important whether or not I'm afraid. Isn't it crazy that we have to consider our fear in discussing this issue? I don't think it's very different from things that have happened many times before. I had lots of fun choosing epigraphs. I had many other ideas. Uh, I did consider just women say no, mum's net, as one of them. <laughs> and another one I thought of, which was very much along the Audrey Lord lines, is that, you know, anyone who's read or read to their children or with their children, the Harry Potter books, will remember the bit where Dumbledore says to, I forget now, does he say it to Harry, that it takes courage to stand up to your enemies and even more courage to stand up to your friends. And I think that that's yeah. something when we say courage here, we don't mean the courage to stand up to those horrible people outside the Philia conference that both of us were at, Alison. That doesn't take any courage, really, because, yeah. you, you know, the police are there and basically they're just men's rights activists putting up disgusting signs of the sort that women are used to. What has been very difficult is and I'm sure we all feel this, is falling out with or saying things that will genuinely lead to people you like and respect thinking ill of you. And I think that that is something that has um, really turbocharged this movement because a lot of people know there's something wrong here, but they either don't have the courage of their convictions, which I understand, you know, it took me a year to decide that there wasn't something I was missing. You know, I kept going around in circles saying, you know, all these people say trans women are women. I can't see it myself, but it must be me that's wrong. And then at the point at which I was sure I wasn't wrong, I was just shocked to realise that people on whom, with whom I agreed on nearly everything else suddenly thought it was as if I had said, you know, Donald Trump is such an amazing man that I'm giving up my job and going to campaign for him. Yeah, it's, it's extraordinary, isn't it? 
You talk in the introduction about the conflict between the demands of the gender ideology for validation by others and the objective primacy of biological sex. Uh, where do you think we are in that contest now, having written? Well, I think that the great majority of people either don't know that this is happening or they still see um, this ideology. So for anyone who hasn't read the book, I, I start by saying, as Alison said, this is not a book about trans people. It's a book about an ideology. And that ideology is that what makes us men or women is what we say we are, not uh, the thing that um, we were born or that we, we were in fact, you know, an egg fertilized. An egg was fertilized by a sperm and at that point it was male or female. So it's an ideology, but it's thought of as being a human right. So that's as if you pick any religion you want. I'm not trying to pick on any one religion. I'll say Catholicism because I was brought up Catholic. It's as if you were to say that recognizing that God is three in one and that Jesus died and was born again and that I have an immortal soul that he died for, if you were recognizing that was an, a human right, as opposed to understanding it as a belief that should be respected in human rights law, that's fine. I'm talking about the actual ontological, as Jane Claire Jones always likes to say, the factual meaning reality claim about the religion. So I think it's a massive category error that most people are making, that they think that the statement that trans women are women is a human rights statement, as opposed to a statement of a belief system. And if we can get them to understand that it's a statement of a belief system, then we can think how to protect it properly in human rights law. And actually the 2010 Equality Act doesn't do a bad job of that. Uh, and Maya Forstatter's case is helping to clarify it as a belief system, which is the right place for it to be. You know, if somebody wants to say that they see themselves and feel themselves to be a woman, I can respect that the same way as I feel that someone, you know, says they're an Orthodox Jew and that has consequences for how they move in the world. It doesn't mean I have to go along with the belief. Yeah, so where are we? I, I guess we're moving from a misunderstanding to an understanding, and most people are still in the great misunderstanding, I'm afraid. And the fact that there's been this enforcement, if you like, on hashtag no debate, that's just meant that we've just got on with the debate without people. Yes, and, and, and not to the better, really. Um, I've become, I, I mean, I wasn't, no one's a free speech absolutist. The people who are called free speech absolutists aren't. Nobody says that you can, um, you know, shout fire in a crowded theatre. We all know that. I always thought I believed in free speech and I believe in it more now ever than I did before. And the big reason that I, be I believe in it more than I did before, isn't it precisely that I found it so difficult to speak? It's that I've watched terrible arguments fly by without being countered. And, you know, that's the central point of free speech is that it helps you to arrive at accuracy and meaning and truth faster. It's, it's not actually about expression as such. Like, yes, it was hard for me to use my voice and to get my voice heard, but so what, I'm just one person. The point is this children being sterilized and they're being sterilized by people who think that they're doing the right thing. Whereas I think if those people hadn't been given the misimpression that I'm a massive bigot, it, um, they might've heard me and that might've already stopped. And it isn't just me, of course, it's other people. So yeah. Um, yeah, no debate is, is, is pretty much gone, I think, at this point. But at this point, sadly, what's happened is people are, are now dug in. So, yes, there are people I think are really bad actors who think that you and I are massive bigots and that everybody on this call is a massive bigot. But mostly it's not people who are really bad actors. It's mostly people who have believed what they're told by organisations and parties that they trust. You know, they've heard what David, David Lammy says. They hear what Stonewall says. You know, they, they thought that... Um, you know, that the Lib Dems were basically sound liberal people. And, and then so they don't bother to examine it. They take the belief uh, wholesale. And now yes. they're not going to hear us. So, they, so, so yeah, so we're talking over here, but they're not actually hearing us. And that's terribly upsetting and it's going to take a long time to undo. Yeah, um, you mentioned, I think there's a, a thought cancelling um, cliche that Lifton talks about. Um, do you want to expand a little bit on that? So this is a book that was written about communist China and how Mao managed to turn, change the country so much and so fast. And anyone who writes about totalitarian regimes um, understands relatively quickly that, yes, OK, you know, the thought police, the, the terror of the 
you know, being put in the gulag or, you know, being tortured or knowing, not knowing who's, who's a member of the Stasi, those things are very important, but actually the person who polices your thought mostly is yourself. So you internalize the thought police. And he examines in this book, among many other things, he examines in this book how that happens. And he created this wonderful expression, the thought terminating cliche, which is, I think it's a, a reductive, plausible and a reductive, entirely plausible expression that becomes the beginning and the end of any analysis. So what would happen if somebody started, if you feel your thoughts wandering in a dangerous direction, um, the thought terminating cliche neatly puts an end to that line of inquiry in your head and you, you never even have to get yourself into trouble. You never even have to think, well, would the thought police like that? Um, what would happen if I said that? Because you don't even get to the point of formulating the thought. So trans women and women functions like that, as you can see when, I mean, I've, se I've seen it happen. It was, there was a wonderful example, uh, example when I think it was Sally Hines went on a uh, woman's hour with Kathleen Stock about three years ago. And she said um, something about, I think it was like toilets or something, like some situation in which you might actually care whether what sex of somebody was. And Heinz, and it might have been Alison Phipps, but I think it was Heinz, cut across her and just said, but trans women are women. Trans women are women. <laughs> so she couldn't engage in the argument at all because she knew that it might lead her somewhere dangerous. If she listened to what Kathleen said, she might have to go, huh, I see what you mean. They're male. And the point of this space is that it's female only. She absolutely couldn't, and on pain of her job, allow that thought to formulate in her mind. And trans women and women solved that problem for her. So it's a, it's a self-censoring moment, isn't it? That's, that's, yeah, and you, know, you, you don't even know. That's right, that's right. It's happening automatically, really. Yeah, you don't so know the, that it's happening. The more that we challenge TWOW, trans women and women and trans men and men, because they're not most of them, most, most of the trans women and most of the trans men don't have a GRC anyway. They don't have that legal sex change. Not that you can actually change your sex. Um, so it's it's uh, irrelevant, isn't it? Um, it is irrelevant, but I mean, of course, the more we challenge it, the more they dig in. So, I mean, we may come to that a bit further down the line, like sort of strategies, but head on shouting at people just makes them dig in. That's true. Um, looking at uh, your account, you covered the history of transsexuality and then in the following chapter, you deal with Green's perspective study and other investigations into gender dysphoria why some people don't want you to know. It's quite heartbreaking to see a, a sort of gay conversion therapy actually going on in the account. There are other boys like your son find activities he likes, such as board games, we would say to the father, so he's not a, an athlete, he still deserves a father. I mean, that's a really poignant moment, isn't it? Yes, so for anyone who hasn't read it, Richard Green was a sexologist who was one of the early people who worked um, in an adult gender clinic, but it occurred to him and to many of the other gender doctors in the sort of 70s or so, you know, at what point and from where did this thing that these men said to them, I was meant to be a woman, or I really am a woman, or there's a woman inside me, at what point did they start to feel like that? And in particular, were they born that way? Or did it happen early in childhood? And so what they wanted to do is to find the sort of kids who were like what these adults said they were like as children and then just watch them unfold. So they advertised in, um, I think it was in LA, in GP surgeries and in similar places. And they found about 50 or 60 boys, all of whom were really very highly gender non-conforming. I mean, he called them sissy boys. And this isn't because Richard was a homophobe. He actually very much wasn't. He was a, an early arguer for gay marriage and he was, a, as, he was both a lawyer and a doctor and he defended many gay men in legal cases um, against them. So, you know, a very progressive person indeed. Uh, his point was that he was making a comment on the stigmatization of this sort of behavior in little boys. And then he found 60 boys who were, you know, sort of normally inverted commas masculine. And he, he, he just followed them. He just met with them a year, every year. And the book's out of print, but I have a copy and it's, you know, it's a big doorstopper of a book. And it has many, many um, extracts from interviews with the kids and the families. And it's actually quite heartbreaking to read if you know any of these very little, these little highly, I don't like the word effeminate. I think it's such a stigmatized word. I would just call them, they're kind of swishy. There's a certain sort of little boy who's very swishy. He, you know, he, he's just kind of like this. Yeah. 
fey yeah. almost and some of those boys grow up into charming heterosexual slightly fey men but loads of them grow up gay yeah. so he found and later studies found that the chances of being gay if you're that highly gender non-conforming little boy much much higher maybe two dozen times higher than it would be if you just randomly picked a boy out of the population and so they followed these boys and all of them said, I was meant to be a girl. I wish I was a girl. They, you know, they dressed up in girls clothes and said, look, mummy, you've got a daughter, et cetera, et cetera. All of them except one stopped doing this during puberty. Uh, and he then he gives statistics for how many of them ended up gay, which was more than half gay or bisexual or um, thought about gay sex more than straight sex. Seriously, the other ones were all gay too. <laughs> you can see it when you read it. Like I'd say that of the, the 50 he managed to follow up with, you know, like maybe five weren't gay. And one, one still said at 19 or 20, I was meant to be a woman. I wish I was a woman. I'd be better if I was a woman. So this was really, this was the first, but there were another dozen studies. And these studies really show as conclusively as anything in this field, like far more conclusively than most stuff, that children who think they were mem they're meant to be members of the opposite sex are actually just you know quite likely to be gay and anyway they'll grow out of it either way in puberty or, or before puberty and i mean one one last thing that i'd say about that um what was, what, sorry i just i just lost my train of thought there there was something i wanted to follow on with that um resolving sexuality no just let's let it go and it'll pop back into my okay. head or it won't I was outraged, actually, by the, the account you gave of the campaign against Michael Bailey, which seems like an early warning of the depth of bad faith that we sometimes uh, uh, see. Um, Autogynophilia appears to be a reason for the rage aimed at dissenting women. It's certainly a part of it. Um, so Michael wrote his book in, I think, 2003, and it's called The Man Who Would Be Queen, and it describes these theories of Ray Blanchard as to why some men seek to transition and so some of them are these kids who were hyper um, oh I know what it was, was I was going to say and it's actually related to this so the last part of this puzzle of what why a child who thinks that he was really meant to be a girl would then transition is it depends on how the society reacts to the way he is so if society goes hmm, where would you like it's fine I'll sort out ballet for you I'm sure they won't mind you joining in the girls group um, you know, you can wear a tutu too, he'll just grow up to be a gay boy. But if his dad tries to toughen him up and he's told he has to get his hair cut short and he gets his dolls taken off him and he's shamed, he then concludes that there's something badly wrong with him. And the conclusion he's likely to come to is, uh, it, 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 you know, it's me, I was meant to be a girl, as opposed to, you know, gosh, aren't I unusual and special and swishy and, you know, maybe I'd like to go on stage or something, you know? <laughs> Like there's yeah. lots of lovely ways that you can move forward as a child like that. And but trying to knock it out of them is the surest way. Like it won't change their sexuality. You don't change people's sexuality. But anyway, some of these kids, they do understand their behavior as meaning that they must be girls. And those kids grow up and they transition and they are often quite successful. They, they pass well and they they're very realistic about it. Like they know what's possible. They're, they're same sex attracted. So their aim is exclusively to try to, you know, like sexually, their aim is to sleep with men. And if they pass well enough and they get good enough, you know, implants and so on, they may succeed in this. So that was one group of the, the, the men that or the trans women that um, Bailey looked at. And the other group was this much different group, which were these older, much more masculine men whose parents said there was no memory whatsoever of them having been effeminate little boys or anything like that. And Blanchard concluded that it was an erotic fixation and interest in themselves as women. And in the end, that erotic fixation became so all consuming that they decided they had to transition. And the thing about that is these men are heterosexual. And so if they transition, they're lesbian, inverted commas, lesbian. And also they require women to play along now, women are often a lot easier about playing along with gay men in their spaces for very obvious reasons. Like lots of women have a best friend who's a gay man who, you know, is a drag queen or he's quite camp and they'll go like, oh, come to, you know, come to the hen party with us. And, you know, th you're one of the girls. Like they, they, they don't even have to be asked. That's the way they feel about that gay man. They do not feel like this about a straight man who's very um, bossy and demanding and domineering, who insists he's a lesbian and wants everyone else to, to play along, you know. So these men have to keep trying 
in a very bullying manner to enforce things on women. And as Ray Blanchard says, these men's rage only affects women because it's only women who have something they want, and that's validation. It's not mostly about men. These men specifically want to be in women's spaces. They don't just want to be in women's spaces because they think they're not safe in men's spaces. They want to be in women's spaces because they want to be women. And the only way you can be a woman is by using all of women's things. I think this very much when I look at the sporting events. So I have family who are um, excellent sports people, both male and female. And I know through them a lot about uh, sports and I know a lot of male sports people. And they all say the same thing when they look at these male people who are on the podium in women's competitions, which is, aren't they ashamed? I'd be ashamed. Like you'd just be embarrassed to win in a women's competition. But these men aren't embarrassed. You see the light of joy and, you know, fulfillment in their eyes. And I, I think they genuinely think that there are two sorts of women. There's the weak, squishy, fat little type of women like you and me. And there's the big, strong, muscular type of woman who's a much better sort of woman like them. I mean, like um, Veronica Ivy, who used to be called Rachel McKinnon, uh, once posted this thing about, you know, I'm naturally talented at putting on muscle. Like, yes, Rachel, that's because you're male. But like, he sees himself as a better woman, you know? And that we need to, we need to try harder. Yeah, we need to try harder. We're just inferior. Like when we say, look, we need our own competitions because men, you know, testosterone does certain things and it makes you stronger. They see that as, a, as an acknowledgement that we are inferior and they are the better type of woman. Yeah. So why does that lead to such rage? Well, it leads to rage because we're withholding something that this person, this man, thinks he wants. And women who say no to men often find that the response is rage. And I think as well, when, when you want something to be true that just simply isn't true, like if, if, if you are male and you wish you were female and you insist that you are female, the only way that you can make it be is by forcing everyone else to say it. So the whole world has to play along in order to support this one person's idea of themselves. And I mean, again, to compare this to religion, like if you think of somebody who is from a very unusual religion, like a really minority sect in our modern secular society, that's not the approach they take. You know, they've worked out to their own satisfaction that they're a small minority. Most people around them don't believe the same as they do. And, and they get on with it. You know, that's kind of what you need. But that's not what's happening here, because if a male person is to be female, the only way that that can be is by forcing everyone else to say it. So it becomes this extraordinarily aggressive language policing, totalitarian sort of imposition upon everyone else. Yeah, it's a demand, really, isn't it? Uh, to go beyond consent. Mm. Yes, yes. And th th your next chapter, chapter four, discusses the catastrophic consequences of an adult ideology for gender dysphoric children. This is really quite sad, isn't it? Um, the, the facts shown by the research as against the ideology of gender identity. So this is the saddest chapter in it, and it is the chapter that is why I wrote it. And um, you know, something that comes to me from my mathematical background is, you know, things have consequences, not necessarily in the places where you start. Like, I think that most people, when they think about trans women or trans men, they imagine very tiny number of people and they think of them all as exceptions. And the thing is, that's kind of what it used to be like. Like, you know, I think the clinic in Toronto that I visited where Ray Blanchard used to work um, would transition 50 people a year. And that wasn't just in that province. It was nearly in the whole of Canada. So these are the sort of numbers that you get in a witness protection program. And I mean, there's nothing about witness protection that's like it is for everybody else. Like they get new birth certificates, they get whole new life histories, like everything, you know, but that doesn't contaminate in a way the rest of our systems. It doesn't mean that the rest of our birth certificates are useless or that the rest of our qualifications are useless. It's really exceptional. But when you try to turn that exception into a rule, and the rule is that everyone is what they say they are, um, and people are men if they say they're men, and women if they say they're women, then it's like saying I have a formula zero equals one over here, but I don't expect that to propagate through the whole of the rest of mathematics. Well, I'm sorry, it does. So you can't do that. You can't, you can't just fence off one bit of a logical system. And a system of laws, for all that our laws can be, uh, you know, not necessarily all that coherent. The fact is laws do impact upon each other, like a right that you grant in one place holds in other places. Yes. So now we have this idea that men are men and women are women, if that's what they say they are. So what does that mean for children? I mean, what it must mean is that 
what we think about as the sex of the child or the gender, if that's the word you want to use, is a provisional thing until they're old enough to tell us. Logically, I mean, that's what it must mean. Like, if I don't know whether you're a man or a woman, Alison, until you tell me which, then that works the whole way back to when you were born. I don't know whether you were a boy or a girl then. So this is what they imagine. They imagine that the doctor looks at little baby Alison and says, oh, looks like a girl. So, you know, she's assigned female at birth. And we'll wait to hear what Alison tells us. Well, Alison may, you know, I'm sorry to invent a horrible life history for you, but, you know, perhaps you were self-harming or you were anorexic or you were abused in childhood or some terrible things like this that make you very unhappy with who you are. And now the explanation that we give you in our culture is that you have a gender identity and that gender identity is disconsonant. So yes. there we go. You know, now every child, we have to wait and see what, what they are, whether they're boys or girls, they'll tell us, we don't know. Mm. Um, and then one further thing, which I think is brought out very nicely by Heather Brunskill Evans and Michelle Moore in their excellent uh, book that well, they've written three now, but in one of them in particular, um, is called Inventing Transgender Children and Young People. And the point they make in particular is that for autogynephilic men, it's it's personally quite important to conceal the erotic nature of their, um, their, their feminine identity, because to them that ruins it. But in this felicitous phrase that I quote from Alice Drager, an American journalist, she says that this is the love that would really rather we did not speak its name. <laughs> so if you say to a gay man, you're gay, he'll go, yeah, I know I'm gay. But if you say to a man who likes to pretend that he's a woman, you're pretending you're a woman, you're ruining it. So those men like to conceal what's happening and, and in particular conceal that it's erotic in nature. So for them, it's particularly important that there are trans children because they are equivalent, to, sorry, their alternative explanation of the whole thing is that we're born with a gender identity that usually matches your body, but it doesn't always. And so really, I mean, you know, Michelle and Heather are very forceful, but I think completely convincing in saying that these children are the sacrifices you know, they're the sacrifices on this adult ideology in order that some men can conceal their erotic motivations, children are being sterilized. Now it is mostly men who are driving this and it is mostly teenage girls who are being impacted by it, it so happens. So teenage girls are being sterilized to hide men's sexual and erotic motivations. Yeah, in the following chapter, you talk about this huge rise in the number of girls identifying as the prospect of womanhood for all sorts of reasons. How can we help girls to resist the allure of gender identification? Well, it's a bit hard, isn't it? Because they think that we're old and boring and they don't want to be <laughs> anything like us. No, I, mean, I think it's always been a problem for women's activism is that there's not a natural solidarity between the generations, or at least if there is, it's undermined. I mean, you could say you can use the word patriarchy or not if you want, but I mean, whatever about every system that we've lived in, young women don't see themselves as having the same sort of solidarity with older women that men have with older men. Yeah. Like younger men think to themselves, I'd like to grow up to be like Jamie Dimon, or I'd like to grow up to be like Barack Obama. You know, women don't think that about, you know, I mean, for a start, it's different sorts of role models, isn't it? It's usually women who are famous for their beauty and their beauty is gone because they're now old. So, you know, men, women, girls don't think I want to grow up to be like Margaret Thatcher. I mean, whatever you think about her politics, that's not my point. So that's the first thing is that the more we try to say to them, we're on your side, we want to help. Actually, we're not helping. It's just very difficult. I suppose it's about the world that they're in to the extent that we can improve the world that we're in and change the things about it that I think in particular cause girls to want to identify out of womanhood. I don't think anymore it's so much about identifying into boyhood, although of course, of course, it's different for child, from child to child. But I mean, actually, you know, the first the first job of women's liberation has been a big success. Women really are able to do nearly everything now. Yeah. So a girl, you know, the, the early people who transitioned, the early um, women who presented themselves as men were doing it to do things like become a doctor when women, were, women weren't allowed to become a doctor at all. Or they went to war, you know, they, they dressed up as boys and went as, as um, sailor boys to, to, to enlist in the Navy, things like that. We don't have to do that anymore. So they're not identifying into boyhood precisely, they're identifying out of girlhood. And if you know any kids aged sort of 15, 16 ish in you know, a liberal city, like you know, in, say in North London or in Cambridge or Oxford or somewhere like that, um, and you actually manage to talk to one of them honestly, they'll tell you that maybe five to 10% of the kids in their class don't identify with their sex. And largely it's girls who call themselves non-binary. 
Mm. So they're more identifying out of girlhood. And I think that they're looking at the image of girlhood as being something extremely perfect, like ridiculously good looking, always on, really Instagram ready. Ever. And that she wants, yeah, and she wants to grow up to be an influencer or, you know, worse than that, to have an OnlyFans. And it's, it's very pornified. And then, of course, all children, in, even in primary school sometimes now, but definitely in secondary school, will have seen really grotesque porn. And it's not, it's not like, if you, know, if you ever you know, found your dad's Playboy magazine or something under a mattress, it's not that. It's grotesque stuff, you know, stuff you know, with triple penetration and absolutely degrading and women being pissed on and beaten and throttled. And I mean, no girl would want to grow up to be a woman if that's what a woman is. And they're sold this ridiculous idea by lib femmes that this is empowering. And that a, you know, a woman might find it um, empowering to be uh, beaten or tied up or humiliated or play these sort of kink games or breath play, as they call it, which means throttling you until you pass out during sex. You know, So it's not surprising that teenage girls want out of all of this. And then this is happening at exactly the moment that they're being told that they should self-examine and work out, am I a boy or a girl? Well, you know, these are the stereotypes associated with boys. These are the stereotypes associated with girls. Which ones do you like? Do you like the sound of being, you know, a fluffy airhead who giggles a lot and likes cooking and knitting and, you know, loves pink and sparkles? Or do you think that you're active, outgoing, domineering, et cetera, et cetera? So it's this perfect storm. Why would you want to be a girl? So the most helpful thing we can do is to fight against the cultural things that make girlhood so awful. So that girls in Abigail Schreier's expression, uh, girls don't feel like they have to abandon it like a burning ship. Yeah, it, it, it's really, you can see it, can't you? They, they don't want to be objectified. They don't want to have the brass straps snapped by the boys in class. And you know, they, they wear the long sweaters to hide the shape that's developing, that's betraying their, their body in a way that they can't understand. It's, it's kind of obvious in a way you would choose. Yes, to, it's never been it, easy. It, it's never been easy to go through puberty. It's not easy for boys yeah. either, but we've never told children that it's optional. We've never yeah. said to children that, you know, if you, if you find being a teenage boy, I mean, I only have sons. It's not easy for the boys either. It really isn't. No. I mean, the physical um, changes are, if anything, even harder, I think, than for girls. Um, I mean, they just grow about a foot in what seems like about three weeks. And I mean, as for the spots and the voice breaking, it's just, and I presume the, you know, the enormous em emotional and... Um, sexual turmoil you know that just you know testosterone hits you like a 10 ton truck yeah. so it's not easy but you knew what you were aiming for at the end and also when there's just no way out of something you don't think about a way out of it so now we've said to kids there is a way out of it well of course some of them are going to take it but of course there isn't a way out of it yes. it's a lie these girls do not get out of the objectification etc by being called non-binary they're promised they will but they won't in, in, indeed, and some of the things that we see celebrated is uh, trans women being celebrated for doing all sorts of amazing things and trans men being celebrated for having babies. It's the only ones, yes. How about that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I see sexism more clearly when I look at people who don't identify with their sex than with people like who do. Who do. Although I did read recently about um, uh, uh, um, a, a, a trans man who had recently died and talking about him sounds quite a character that he had taken it upon himself to encourage uh, uh, non-conforming people and I thought that sounded like a really good bloke actually for you know, a woman yeah. who'd taken that avenue and uh, and made those strides. I mean one and thing that's really if, if I may say it's possibly a good moment to say this which is that I think that trans identified people are very poorly served by their activists you know, this lie that they're all meant to play along <laughs> with. Yeah, I mean, in many ways, one being that they're absolute head cases who do things like turn up at feminist conferences and put up absolutely grotesque and obscene signs, which makes them look awful. But more than that, if you're going to embark on something so difficult and unusual as to try to present yourself as a member of the opposite sex, you really have to have your head screwed on. I mean, yeah. it may work. It may make you feel better if you really feel bad. But you're going to need to be really clear about what you're doing. But the activists are making it much harder for you to be clear. Yes, that's right. Um, I'm just looking at uh, Toby Keane's question. How much incidence is there of trans men, that is to say natal women, aggressively asserting their male identities and demanding recognition from other men? And specifically asserting that gay men who are not attracted to them are just prejudiced. 
I mean, it happens. Uh, there's a, a Mr. Gay England prize, I think it is. Um, I may have got the title of that wrong anyway. It's a sort of beauty pageant thing, but it's gay men. And uh, I don't think they've judged it yet, but one of the finalists is a trans man. Uh, yes. Somebody called Chico Prince and Prince is spelled with an X. Um, it, 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 I mean, this is a very attractive, very, you know, super edgy butch lesbian as far as I'm concerned, but not lesbian because she's straight, um, but like that kind of style. And she um, presented herself as a drag king. She worked as a drag king, but then she transitioned and she's had a mistake to me and I should stop calling her she at this point, shouldn't I? But anyway, uh, this person is, is a finalist in Mr. Gay England, which, you know, if you say anything about it as a gay man, you will get kicked out of wherever you are. So there are some, but obviously um, it is not the general case that female people are able to aggressively impress themselves upon males and demand sex. So it's, it's less common. And then the other thing that you do see is um, trans men doing quite dangerous things legally in attempting to uh, separate the concept of woman and mother-in-law. So Freddie McConnell, who is a trans man who I think is pregnant for the second time at the moment, went to the High Court to attempt to be named as father rather than mother on the child's document. Yeah. Which would mean this child had no mother and not in the sense that, you know, a child adopted by two gay men might not have any mother. But, you know, the fact is that, that child at age 18 could, would be able to apply for more information about his birth mother. You know, this would be a child who literally had never had a mother. Um, so the High Court, in my opinion, completely correctly said no, that the birth certificate was owned by the child, not the mother uh, or the parent. So, but these things are very dangerous for all women. That's a very, very dangerous case. And then the third one I would highlight is that behind the moves to put um, trans prisoners in prisons consonant with their sex in Scotland is in fact a trans man, a trans man in um, a Scottish trans, trans, Scottish trans alliance, trans Scottish alliance. Uh, so I don't understand the motivation behind that, but this is a female person who thinks that uh, male rapists and murderers should be imprisoned with women. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, we're not saints necessarily, females. Okay. No, we're not. Um, I, I, Helen's made the point. Uh, she liked the analogy of the shoeshine boy in Chapter 5. Um, and she says, has the bubble burst? Uh, the shoeshine boy who was pushing stocks in the, just before the Depression. That's right. Yes. So it's meant to be this moment that when like absolutely like, you know, your, your taxi driver and his dog are telling you to buy stocks. That's the point at which yeah. you should sell fast. <laughs> so, I mean, in a way, it's um, it's a slightly false analogy because for a bubble to inflate, you have to have certain conditions. In particular, you have to have an asset that can be sold on because something that drives bubbles is what they call the greater fool theory. So you buy something knowing that it costs a lot more than it's worth. But you think there's a greater fool who'll buy it from you if you want to sell. And then you come to the point that you've run out of fools. You can't sell it and the price slumps. So even as I was writing it, I knew it wasn't a massively accurate analogy, but it is genuinely what I thought when I listened to Kay. Like I was thinking seriously, this is a, a, a young woman who decided that she was a gender, largely because she couldn't make any sense of gender identity. Uh, theory and she you know about 18 months believed that she wasn't a girl on the basis of this so I just thought like god if you can reach that far is that the shoeshine boy um I think there's a two-part answer to that is uh, there one is that with teenagers this is definitely driven by to a considerable extent by fashion and nothing is fashionable forever and in particular when your teachers are belly aching on about things it definitely isn't fashionable <laughs> so now that every second bloody, you know, assembly in school is about trans identities and so on, really, it's going to stop being fashionable. It is not going to be fashionable in two years time to call yourself non-binary and change your name to Phoenix, as half the girls in schools that I know are doing at the moment. <laughs> so that's going to burn out. But at the same time, unfortunately, teaching materials are changing in primary school. That worries me more than secondary. I mean, in secondary, what your teachers tell you is basically what you disagree with. Uh, but in primary, um, small children especially aren't very clear in their minds about what a boy is and what a girl is. They, you know, they, they think that you can change sex. They genuinely do. They think that changing hairstyles and clothes changes a yeah. doll's sex and maybe even a person's sex as well. I'm talking about a five or six year old here. So if you can get in then at four, five or six and tell children that it's choice whether you're a boy or a girl. We don't know who's a boy or a girl. And in particular, if there are adults in their lives who are very clearly male, but they're meant to say that this person is female or vice versa. 
then we actually could be raising a generation of people who quite genuinely have got messed up in their heads about what it is to be male or female. This is an experiment, I don't know, we haven't played it out. But so I, I think that the, the bubble of teenage girls whipping each other up into ridiculous identities, um, and it really is ridiculous, like, and it, it's, it's sexualities as well as um, genders. So someone I know who has an 11 year old who has just started at secondary school said in the first week, a girl that she was a bit scared of would said some nasty things to her about wearing earrings and things that they sort of plonked down next to her daughter at lunchtime and said, uh, who here is LGBT? I'm pansexual. <laughs> and the rest of the table went, eh, what? And this girl said that they all had to go and look at the poster in the hall because, you know, not everybody is a cisgender something or other. And like literally nobody else knew what she was talking about. But, you know, so, so it's, it's, it's pangender, pansexual, you know, demigender. Neutroir. Neutroir, <laughs> all these things. Like, this is not going to go on forever. This is Pokemon. Yeah. Um, but that's not what worries me. I mean, I think it's actually a terribly regressive and time-wasting and sometimes very confusing and can lead on to medicalization thing. But basically, it's just like being a punk yeah. or, you know, a, a goth or something. Yeah. And those things don't last. Yes. But it, it, it is damaging. And you go on in your next chapter to talk about how the whole gender identity ideology is harmful to all children because it messes them up, as you just yeah. said. Yeah, so it messes them up and it also undermines safeguarding. Yes. So that's it's very a, worrying. That's a real problem, isn't it? In all sorts of societies like Girl Guides and, and uh, such like. Yeah, in two, in two big ways. Uh, and, you know, in case anyone is misunderstanding what I'm saying, I'm not saying that trans identified people are any more likely than other people to be child abusers. In fact, I don't think they are. I just think that there's a rate for males and a rate for females. And that when people are allowed to trans identify, you're misclassifying the groups. You're counting a male as a female and a female as a male. You're letting males fly through as if they're females who are very, very low risk to children. Mm. And, you know, we know, I mean, I'm Irish. I'm of a generation that remembers the, the church scandals. We know what happens when you say that some men are a sacred caste who cannot be criticized and that are above all suspicion. Very bad things happen because that, that, that attracts the worst men. So that's the sort of the terrible risk. That's the, you know, the Jimmy Savile risk that if you don't, if you're not careful, you end up with a really grotesque predator who causes enormous harm to hundreds and maybe thousands of children. But the other one is that the principles of child safeguarding require open communication with parents and an open attitude where anyone can say anything they're concerned about and that nobody's thoughts or language or, or, or utterances are policed. So if a child is worried about something, the child must feel completely free to express that to the adults in their lives. So a child who wants to say, honestly, I don't feel comfortable about having someone I know as a boy in my changing room, now is told she's a bigot. Yes. So you're teaching children to, um, you know, to, you're teaching children to, to stay quiet about their fears and their worries. It's totally unhelpful to the whole of safeguarding. Oh, yes, and you're cutting out parents as well, by the way. So parents are just assumed to be massive bigots, all parents. So we don't tell parents anything um, because they might be the sort of person who would torment and abuse and uh, abandon their child if they knew their child was LGBT. So I'm not saying there aren't parents who are bigots. There absolutely are. But there's whole protocols for dealing with parents that you don't cut them out, that you assume the best of them at first, but you're alert to problems. You know, you escalate if you need to and so on. But instead, now we're saying that we will keep secrets from parents, specifically the secret of a child who says they want to transition. So it's very, very dangerous. And we've got this world class safeguarding protocol system in the UK that America just doesn't seem to get at all. God knows why. And we're throwing it away. That's right. I mean, this, this country really genuinely has the world's best system of child safeguarding. I, there's, you know, when I talk to people in Canada or in the US about this, about the way that we painstakingly learned from the scandals, they're like, that's amazing because it's so well thought through and the training is so good and the principles are so good. And now we've driven a coach and horses through it. Um, but uh, there are people who are making it their business to try and rectify that and, and make sure that safeguarding is we, we had a couple of speakers from safer schools alliance last month and they, they were really 
uh, thoroughgoing in their uh, attitude. But the fact is that they're seen as hate groups. Yeah, again, I mean, nobody could think they're hateful if they meet them. They're just basically a bunch of mums, you know, who just aren't having it. Um, But, you know, they've been pre-cancelled. You don't need to listen to them because you know they're hateful before they open their mouths. And and the other thing about uh, harming children generally is that the the parents who are affirming that they can never allow themselves, you say, to entertain the possibility that setting their child on the path to trans adulthood might have been an error. They can't. We can't. I'm very sorry for anyone whose child um, says they want to transition. Like, I, I can't imagine a more difficult dilemma. I by now know quite a lot of people who've been through this and there is no, there's no good answer and there's certainly no one way to do it. I mean, I do have some suggestions if anyone's in that situation, but I mean, they're very limited compared to the challenge that's ahead of you. But at some point with a kid who persists in demanding to transition, at some point you're going to have to make a call in your mind. And one possibility is that you say, I'm not doing this. This child is waiting until they're an adult. And then you're going to be tormented by one of the things the trans lobby insists, which is that your child is going to kill themselves. And I mean, it's the worst thing that any parent can ever imagine happening is that their child will kill themselves and that they've caused it. So you are accepting that um, horrendous thought. Now, those statistics are fake. They're really invented, but you're still going to think it, aren't you? And people are going to tell you that you're putting your child on the path to suicide. Or you jump and you decide your child is going to transition, in which case it's incredibly important that you never, ever hear a word that I say again, because it's too painful. And it's going to be one or the other. You're going to have to try not to hear the people saying suicide, or you're going to have to try not to hear the people saying sterilization. And I I understand that people sometimes make one choice because they think they have no other option that is a good one. And then they have to really spend the rest of their lives attacking me. (laughs) <laughs> you're, you're, in, you're in a great company, I have to say. Yeah, no, I don't just mean me. I mean me and everyone else on this. Yes. Um, uh, the claim that we just need to pee is another brilliantly titled chapter, analyzes the harms in, in prisons, in refuges, as well as sex separated facilities that go back, as Bolet Carter says, back to the Roman baths and, and before. Um, and yet we know why we have sex segregated facilities for our safety for a fair competition. I mean, you say that, you say that, Alison, but like last week I was talking to some, and I won't say who, but like an important person. And um, he said to me, but why do you keep saying that women won't be safe if men can get into their spaces? I mean, you're you're talking as if men, all men are rapists. And so I did the whole, like, you know, Kathleen Stock's great line that, uh, you know, single sex spaces aren't a character reference for all men. They're just, you know, we know very few men commit rapes, but it's only men who commit rapes pretty much you know, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And he said, but that's not why you have single sex spaces. So I said, hang on a second, that is why we have single sex spaces. And he said a few times, are, are you telling me that the reason we have single sex spaces is because you're not safe if, if they weren't single sex? And I was like, literally, yes. That is exactly why we have single sex spaces. What did he think it was for? <laughs> I think he'd never really thought about it. I think he thought it was just a sort of a, I mean, the queer theorists over the past 15 years have tried to claim that it's a kind of a weird genteel affectation um, that, okay. you know, Victorian madams sort of, you know, and, and also patriarchal men that they wanted to shuffle men off, women off into special their own spaces. So, so some people either say they don't understand why or they genuinely don't understand why. And then the other thing is there's this awful temptation that we all have to do what I call like going straight to rape. We just say, you know, people say, what's the harm in this? And they want to know how many people have been raped. They want to know how many women have been raped because you let men into women's toilets. And as far as I'm concerned, that's not the main harm. That's the worst harm, but it's not the main harm. The main reason that we have single sex spaces where we undress and so on is because it's embarrassing to have people of the opposite sex there. We don't feel dignified. And so that influences, that affects every woman. Every woman who loses single sex spaces is affected straight away. We don't have to count. We don't have to try and find the rapes. Yeah. And it also affects the boys in schools too, because they need privacy. Your boys Absolutely. need privacy just as much as my grandsons, you know, because they're, they're growing, they're different and they're changing. And they don't want to be invaded by girls, necessarily. Yeah, when I started writing about this, a colleague of mine, a close friend from when I started The Economist that I hadn't seen for a while, 
uh, he walked past me in the corridor and without even saying hello, he said, Helen, we don't want you when you're at our toilets either. And I said, <laughs> I know. And we walked on away from each other. <laughs> so no, absolutely, the men don't want it either. Um, but but it's been made to feel like it's embarrassing if we say that. And then something that I, you know, I really am becoming more determined to say, and I feel I can say it because I'm an atheist. So religious people find it very hard to speak out these days, especially religious women because they're treated as if they're massive, massive backward bigots if they say anything. So if an Orthodox Jewish woman says without apology, without any you know, beating around the bush, no, this space has to be female only because I cannot not use it otherwise. Then people are like, yeah, well, that's Orthodox Jews, isn't it? They're really backward. And they're, or they're the same about somebody who's a conservative Muslim. You know, they're just like, oh, well, you're homophobes as well, aren't you? Like, look at the way that they talked about those parents in them. Um, what was the town where they had those protests outside the school? Yeah, Natalie, in, in was it Bur Natalie? Yeah, somewhere like that. Wasn't the yes. one in, in Birmingham too? Yeah, so these are Muslim parents who are trying to say, you are teaching our children things that we are not at all happy with. Now, some of those things are actually about gay sex. And I do think that all children should be told that in this country, it is possible for two men or two women to marry, because that is a fact, and this is the country that they live in. But it was also about gender identity stuff. Mm -hmm. And those parents were just talked about right across the media like they were absolute bigots who, could not, who did not need to be listened to. But the fact is they have the protective characteristic of religion or belief. And it is their right to bring their children up in their beliefs. And also the reason that we have things like women only swimming sessions in boroughs of London that have a high Muslim or Jewish population is because they know the women won't use the swimming pool otherwise. So they say this hour is for women only. Well, the Orthodox Jewish women aren't going to come if a trans woman can use it. But they're finding it very hard to say that because they just get written off as backward bigots. And it's the same as the Hampstead Women's Pond, isn't it? That's right. We That's right. Women bathing. Um, uh, going on to sport in Chapter 9, uh, being separated by sex, not gender. It, it's obviously fair, fair competition. Yes. And it's a provision in the Gender Recognition Act as well as the Equality Act. And I think uh, you said nobody was talking about it, but I think Colin Moynihan, the Olympian, who's now in the Lords, I think he argued for it when it was a bill. Um, I, th I think he made a point about it uh, being necessary to exclude. Right, yes, yes. No, it's now really, the thing that's horrifying me at the moment is that there are organisations whose job it is to say this, in particular the Equality and Human Rights Commission. That was set up after the Equality Act. So for anyone who doesn't, doesn't know, the Equality Act is basically a, a massive tidying up exercise that turned nearly a hundred separate laws, some of them which came in response to legal cases, others of which were, you know, acts like the um, Sex Discrimination Act or whatever. It tidies them all into one overarching law that has nine protected characteristics within it of which um, yeah, pregnancy and maternity is something that not everybody can have and disability is something that not everybody can have but everything else is something that all of us have all of us have a religion or belief or lack of all of us have a sex all of us have an age all of us have a race you know that sort of thing and it tells us when it is permissible or not permissible for an employer employer or a service provider to discriminate so the general starting point is you don't discriminate and the second in, you know, on these nine characteristics. But the second thing is you may discriminate if that's in the um, service of greater equality. So you can't you can't say you're only going to employ over 30s in a job, but you can say this playground is for under 10s because there's a sensible reason to do that, which is the big kids will scare the little kids and they'll swing and the little kids will never get on the swing. Yes. So that, that's, that's the framework of it. And then the Equality and Human Rights Commission was set up in order to monitor compliance and in order to do things like take test cases, to produce guidance, to advise government, all that sort of thing. And within it, it says really specifically that one of the places that you might want to discriminate on the basis of sex is sport. Because in the service of greater equality, unless you discriminate on the basis of sport, you basically have no women doing anything competitive. Like at every level, men are just stronger than women. And that's true like at the you know, under 15s, it's true at the under 20s, it's true in your community sport, it's true in the Olympics. So that's, that's how you should understand it, that it's not fair to discriminate in general, but you may need to discriminate to be fair. And they specifically say sport is one of the places where you're likely to have to discriminate. Well, what did the Equality and Human Rights Commission do? when World Rugby said that they, they thought you needed to keep trans women out of women's sports. 
F all is the answer. Nothing. They said nothing, nothing at all. They could simply have said, yeah, that makes sense. That's one of the examples that's given in the Equality Act. Yeah, that's all. Just say, yeah, that's right. That's what we thought about 10 years ago. And do you think things are changing there? Because you did see the uh, the chair of the EHRC come out and say in Mayer's um, appeal, didn't she? That was making a, a statement. Yes. Yeah, so she has done several fairly high profile things. She's quite new and she's clearly a huge improvement. Um, I think something we have to recognise is that while we weren't looking, while we were sleeping, all these organisations have just rotted from the inside. Mm. Uh, and now I don't know, I don't know, I have not done any reporting on the HRC. I don't know what's happening inside it. So I'm just speculating now. I, I suspect that it is absolutely filled to the brim with people who believe that trans women are women and that the attempt is that Kishwa Kish Faulkner is attempting to, uh, to try to rein it in. But I mean, this is true right across the public sector, right across big businesses, right across tech. You have just got people in HR departments who you know, wear pronoun badges, say that if you don't put your pronouns in your email signature, you're a bigot, you know, have turned all the toilets into mixed sex, et cetera, et cetera. Somebody used the analogy the other day, to, day for me that this is a bit like Japanese knotweed. And you know, you've pulled out the visible bits <laughs> if you get you know, Stonewall out of all the organizations or something like that, but actually it's still below the ground and it can come back yeah. because it's now embedded in all these organizations. So we can't just expect Kishra to be able to turn things around on her own. She can't. It's this massive fighting. I know that lots of people have been sending postcards and cards to say thank you for the people like Kishra Faulkner and Liz Truss and other people who've come out and said things. I think somebody said sent uh, 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 cards to Sarah Ludford recently who spoke out. And I know our group um, said something nice about Baroness Brinton when she spoke out on behalf of women in the in the laws recently. And I think it's up to us really to encourage the people who are doing the right thing to feel that they've got people behind them. I think that's absolutely right. It gives them courage. Um, and then of course, the people who are the minions, you know, the second and third and fourth tiers in these organizations, I don't, I think a lot of them are just doing because they think that's what they're meant to do. Like I can't imagine that many people really regarded as their life's work to destroy women's sport. I mean, obviously some, amazingly, there are some people <laughs> like that. But most people aren't like that. And if it stops being the done thing, they'll stop doing it. Now, you talk about this, don't you? Um, you talk about it. I thought it was a really great idea. Uh, this is the crony belief. I really love that concept. Tell us about this. Right. So I found this when I was trying to like one of the things that happens, you know, when you talk about this, people say to you, where did this come from? And then they say to you, how did this happen so fast? Uh, why is everyone going along with this? And for a long time, I, mean, I still don't know that I've got the complete answer, but for a long time, I had no answer. I was like, because it just seems so crazy to me. Why is anyone going along with it? And then I found um, there's quite a lot of research on why people believe the things that they believe. Um, and a lot of the time it's for social reasons. And you may think that's not you, but it is you. So if you think about the things that we all basically believe now, like, for example, that um, the, the, the monarch isn't literally God's representative on Earth. Or, you know, most people believe that it's not right to duck witches or, you know, these things that are really absolutely no longer part of our thesis. The fact is, if you'd lived three or four centuries ago, you would have believed these things. You should know that. You really would have believed them. And it's because the people around you believed them. Yes. So, you know, we, it behoves us all to be, um, you know, not too full of ourselves on this subject. We all of us take cues from the people around us as to what is right. But also we believe things because it's socially useful for us to believe them. And I think that a, it is my thesis, in fact, that a lot of the people who are even quite um, vigorous in their, their insistence that trans women are women and all the other things that go along with that don't actually believe it in the sense of the way that I believe that planes fly. I mean, one of the things, one of the things I imagine is, you know, suppose I were into witchcraft. Well, I have, I'm in Ireland at the moment. I flew to Ireland on Saturday. <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm not really going to go and get my broom because I don't believe witchcraft in that sort of way. I'm still going to go and get a Ryanair ticket. So there are the two sorts of different beliefs. One of them is the belief that maybe if I were in, you know, if I were a Wiccan, is my whole social life, my belief system, the people I care about, the way I structure my life, the identity that I state. And the other one is what I do when I want to get from A to B. 
<laughs> so the first one is a sort of crony belief and the second one is what's called a merit belief and it doesn't mean that it's a better or worse belief it could be a very bad belief but it's a belief that's I, I hold the belief because I think it works yeah so my my contention is that most people who say trans women are women are saying it in a crony belief way and the example that I have given that I thought about with this one is really about Owen Jones and another gay man whose name I can never remember, Casper Salmon, that's it, I don't know who that is, but anyway, the two of them were having this conversation online about being broody, and one of them said to the other, um, yeah. uh, what we need is, you know, what you need is some broody lesbians, but the thing is, they're both trans women or women people, and Owen Jones in particular regards the statement that, a, you know, a woman, lesbians don't have penises, he regards that as a particularly bigoted statement, so what does he want broody lesbians for? What if they're the sort of lesbians that have penises? So, <laughs> you know, he, he doesn't mean, he, he doesn't mean lesbians actually. He means assigned female at birth. Well, some of those assigned female at birth people are men and he's a gay man. So why the hell doesn't he just find himself a trans man and have, you know, lovely gay penis and vagina sex and make a baby the old fashioned way? Well, that didn't occur to him. What occurred to him was he wanted a lesbian. So he's a liar, he's a liar to himself. He doesn't believe that trans women are women. He knows very well when it comes down to something that matters to him that trans women are not women. And he's a bully as well because he wants to bully the lesbians. He doesn't want to have anything to do with the trans men. Yeah, but no, of course. Yeah, so I mean, Owen Jones is the type of person who regards women as, as uh, scenery and uh, supporting tools. actresses. Tools for him to use. I, I think it's even more than that. They're decorative around the side, you know. I mean, so when you know, if the sofa were to speak to you and say, "Get off me! I don't. You're too heavy. I don't like it. I want to go moving around myself," you'd be cross. So he he always gives me that impression when he speaks back to women that he thinks he's very cross that we had the cheek to say anything about ourselves yeah. and our boundaries and needs. That's true. Um, America has really fallen hard for this, uh, and Canada as well. They're Canada. They they call it, don't they? Um, women have an extra reason for wanting single sex spaces when they're vulnerable or naked as protection against male sexual violence. But America has really gone to town on dis dis destroying every single sex space that has been created. Why? So the two things that I pick out in the book as being the major drivers, one is the um, polarization, the political polarization, which means that ideas, you know, the way that polarization works is that you look at your own lunatics and you think, well, the other lunatics are worse. And if I say anything about my lunatics, I'm giving uh, weapons and ammunition to them. So I better stay quiet about my lunatics. And then a second thing happens with polarization. And I, I saw this very much when I was a child looking at Northern Ireland. So, you know, the, the people who were shaping Northern Ireland when I was in my formative years, in my teens, 20s, 30s, there were four political parties, two very extreme and two much more moderate. And you ask yourself, why are people voting for the extreme parties who are not going to ever make a peace deal? And the answer is because they see politics as something like a tug of war. That, you know, if, you, if you're afraid that the Catholics might pull the rope towards them, well, you better vote for Ian Paisley because I mean, he's literally a man who says the Pope is the whore of Babylon, but he's not going to give an inch. Whereas you're afraid that David Trimble might give an inch. So polarization means that you just keep heading further and further and further out. And it also means that you don't examine the specific policies that are part of your policy bundle because you couldn't bear the other policy bundle. So, you know, when Donald Trump is over there, it seems a bit irrelevant that, you know, um, that, they, that Biden is saying that women don't exist. I mean, that's the way it works. And also, of course, abortion is a big one there. Like if you're afraid, literally afraid that you might lose your right to, to, to abortion, you know, that's the first fight. Yeah. And then the second one is the legacy of the way that slavery played out uh, in America. So this is not to say that there wasn't racism and that there wasn't slavery in British colonies, but there wasn't the same sort of institutionalized chattel slavery for such a long period in a relatively recent period of Britain's history on British soil. So that, you know, and, and then there wasn't anything like the Jim Crow laws either. So American, any, any decent American, is desperately ashamed and, and scarred in a way by the history, the horrible history of American racism. And it's taught them a sort of, a, it's given them a sort of a template that they think about all differences in. So if you think about racism, you think about people saying things like separate but equal. You know, here's the drinking fountain for the whites, here's the drinking fountain for the blacks. 
And then somebody says, oh, but we need to have, we, we, we need to have separate facilities for men and women and we can't let the trans women into the women's facilities because actually they're men. And Americans hear horrible echoes because they're not able to say separate but equal. Mm-hmm. And the fact is women and men are separate but equal in the situations where sex matters. We're not separate but equal in society in general, we're just equal. But in the few places where sex matters, it has to be separate but equal. And yet Americans find it very hard to formulate that expression. So no one was full-throatedly standing up for that. So I should say one more thing, which is that American feminism went down a really bad path. So it went down this very academic, um, you know, know, up its own arse, frankly, uh, route. And, you know, while feminists in Britain were the people who were, you know, leading strikes and you know, getting laws about uh, maternity pay and so on. American feminists never succeeded in any of those things. And they're just, it's a much more middle class. And by middle class, I mean like upper middle class, like academic, um, right. unrooted feminism. And that's the sort of feminism that has a lot of fun trying to invent different meanings of woman and social roles or bullshit like that. So yeah, they didn't have feminists to stand up for them. They thought they were replaying racism and nobody can listen to anything that people on the other side say in America. So they're doomed. I, I, I was struck by uh, your quotation from Marilyn Fry, um, uh, a collection of essays published in 1983. It's always the privilege of the master to enter the slave's hut. The slave who decides to exclude her master from her hut is declaring herself not a slave. That's really strong, isn't it? It's very powerful. It's, uh, it's this ridiculous idea. And I mean, this is said by many Americans, including at one point by the attorney general, that when women keep trans women out of our spaces, we are literally like uh, white people keeping black people out of their spaces. But that mixes it up. So that's to say that women's spaces are where we rule the world. Like a woman's space is something like the Garrick Club, you know, like when you go into when women go into our toilets that we're we're plotting to keep men down. And that's where we do our billion dollar deals and buy and sell and decide who's going to be the next prime minister or something. You know, that's not what we're doing. We're I mean, I don't want to I'm going to exaggerate for effect. It's where we're cowering in a little tiny safe space that's been carved out of a world owned and run by men. It's a little retreat from us. So what for us from the dominant culture? It's not prejudice that means that women keep men out of their spaces. It, it, it is frankly prejudice that makes men keep women out of the Garrick Club. Yes. So, so they've just got it the wrong way around. And that's, that's what Marilyn Fry is saying. She's saying that if the, if the master says the slave can't come in, that's, that's prejudice, that's racism in, in the American um, situation. But when a woman, when the, when the slave says, this is my hut, no further, you come over this uh, this threshold only on my invitation that is the slave standing up and saying i'm human too true that's it's a great piece and um, looking at chapter 11 you're really strong on uh the covert nature of uh the gender ideologies advance you you quote them talking about flying under the radar and stealth and and that really is forcefully brought out the polling on page 225 shows that the reservations are firmer when the explicit differences are clear Uh, And you touched on some very rich people who seem to have underwritten a lot of the policy capture. And I know you got some pushback from that. Um, And, you know, do you want to deal with that? Um, So the pushback, in case anyone doesn't know, is that there are some anti-Semitic people out there who think that if you say rich people, you mean Jews. This never occurred to me what religion anyone involved was. And by the way, they're not all Jews anyway. Some of the things people said was, you know, why did she pick three Jewish people? I didn't. Um, so if you're not an anti-Semitic person, then it maybe doesn't occur to you to be careful about saying anything about rich people, because the fact is, it is just a fact that there are some very rich donors to this. Now, that's a bit like gay marriage, by the way, as well. And um, rich donors love really clear cut, concrete things that can be achieved by a legal change. I mean, you can see why you can achieve, you can say job done. Um, they don't so much like open-ended, difficult, never achieved type things. So that's why it's much, much easier uh, to fundraise for, say, uh, gay marriage, which is a cause that I absolutely espoused, than it would be to fundraise for, say, a network of shelters for abused women and children. Um, Because there are always going to be abused women and children. Like, I wish that wasn't the case, and obviously I want there to be fewer. But you're never going to win. This job will never be done. 
So rich donors love silver bullet legal changes, except JK Rowling, who is a woman. <laughs> to, yes, it's very special. Yes, in general, rich donors prefer their, their legal changes. So once gay marriage was won, all these organizations that had hundreds of well-paid staff, and in America's case, thousands and even tens of thousands between them all, and um, they could see themselves just with the donations drying up. And they needed another sort of specific silver bullet -y legal type change that could take its place. And the trans lobby groups were ready to say it's gender self-identification. But there's a really big difference between uh, gay marriage and gender self-ID. I mean, there are many big differences, but the specific one I want to say is that the more people know about gay marriage, the more they like it. The more gay people come out, the more that you realize that somebody you've worked with, that you've known for a long time, that you've always liked, actually, he has a boyfriend, not a girlfriend. And now that this is becoming normalized, he's bringing that boyfriend to the company barbecue. You start to feel sympathetic and you want that, them to be able to marry. So that's the direction of travel there. On the trans thing, you might feel very sympathetic towards somebody individually who wants to come out and think, gosh, that was hard and they'll be very supportive and, you know, I'll make sure that nobody's mocking or anything like that. But when that person says, and I want to be able to come in and use the women's showers, or when they say, you know, actually, I want to be on the women's rugby team, you become less sympathetic, not more. So that makes an enormous difference to the way that you have to campaign for the two things. With gay marriage, yes, they wanted the legal change, but the way that you got the legal change was to get the nation's hearts and minds behind you. So by the time gay marriage was brought in in both the UK and the US, and I'm sure everywhere else, but I've seen the poem for those two countries, public opinion was well ahead of a majority. Like, you know, you're on 60, 65% polling that people wanted it. And, and they were there before the politicians, they led the politicians. The politicians often apologized, in fact, for having been slow. But the other way around, the campaigners, I think they instinctively know how very unpopular it will be to make everybody have to pretend that there's no such thing as biological sex or that they can't see it. And so you go straight for the law and then you get the law passed as a fait accompli. So that's the mixture of behind the scenes and rich people. I mean, if that makes me an anti-Semite, you know, you tell me. I, I don't think there's any question of it in anybody's sensible mind, but uh, any stick will do to beat a dog with. My yeah. dad used to say, and that's uh, that's the one they used. But I, I saw that your rebuttal is all over your um, is on your your website, so people who want to know can go and look at it later. Um, what advice would you give to anyone else wanting to write about the harms of this ideology, apart from don't? <laughs> but oh, that's not my advice. That's not my no? advice at all. Um, okay. So something that I've really realised as I've watched Kathleen Stock and what she's been put through. Um, if I go back a bit further, Julie Bindel has been saying for a long time, I think really since it started happening to her, which was 2004, that if she wasn't the only person who was talking about this, or one of the few people talking about it, she wouldn't get all the flack. And obviously there's some truth to that, there's strength in numbers. But when I looked at Kathleen, I thought, um, it's not exactly flack that she's getting in the same way that Julie did, because Julie is of course self-employed. So, you know, they have to attack Julie to try to stop people from taking freelance articles. And that's often been very successful. Like she's really suffered professionally from it. With Kathleen, what they were doing was a, a public demolition of the sort that is like putting somebody in the stocks or on the pillory. Like it's a public shaming. Mm. And people aren't rescued from the pillory by going and standing by them or by having more people put in the pillory. It just puts more people outside polite society. You have to actually stop the pillory itself as a means of punishment. And the only people who get put in pillories are people who don't have um, powerful protectors or social capital. So, you know, rich people weren't put in the pillory. It was the, you know, the witch who was blamed for something or, you know, whatever, some couple who were found fornicating or something like that. And once you were put in the pillory, you were outside the rules of polite society. So people can talk about you and to you and do things to you that are not normally allowed. And that's the case forever. You've now been put outside polite society. So we have to stop that. So how do you stop it? Well, the only person who can stop it is somebody powerful. And basically for most of us, that's the employer. So if Kathleen Stock's employer at the University of Sussex had immediately all of this kicked off three years ago in 2017 or whenever it was that she started to talk about the gender self-idea reform, 
if they had said, absolutely not having this, we believe in academic freedom, we stand by her 100%, she's a valued member of staff, and anybody who uh, attempts to threaten her or harass her will not only be sanctioned um, by the university, but we will be reporting them to the police. If they had yeah. said that, it would have stopped immediately. And I know that because it could have happened to me, but my employer did that. My employer said, not having it, good journalist, we believe in free speech, we dislike bullies, and they went away. So you need to have your employer behind you because the first thing that these people do is to try to make it impossible for you to earn a living. They want to take the food from your mouth, they want your children on the street, they want you to lose your house. And that's the fear they rely on in trying to silence people. So I would say if you want to talk about this publicly or to write about it, the first thing you need to know is, is your job or your income safe? So if you are independently wealthy, good for you. I don't know why you're on this call. If that's the case, you should be <laughs> off uh, in, um, in some island somewhere enjoying the sun. Um, but, you know, perhaps you're retired or perhaps you're self-employed. Like um, Tanya from Safe, Safe Schools Alliance is married to, I think, a builder. And when she started, people would say, you know, I'm going to tell your employer. And she's like, you know, I do my husband's accounts. He doesn't care. You know? So if that's you, brilliant. Um, if you have reason to believe that your employer is not going to stand by you you are in a very difficult position and I can't I can't advise you to lose your job no. we're not there yet and um, when Maya's case is won as I hope it will be in the final analysis then we can start to make it possible for people to speak without risking losing their jobs but until then not now it's suppose just, you are we just, just reached that stage though that it's protected belief so they can't fire you for being GC. Yeah, they can. I mean, what they can do, what, what, um, Maya's, what Maya's next hearing will be about is about the practicalities of it. It's now a protected belief, but we don't know how that's going to be um, interpreted in terms of the facts of the matter. So what it could be is, yeah, it's a protected belief, but of course, if you mention anything about it, you know, that's harassment. Um, the Free Speech Union is a good idea too. But, but I, just, I just want to say that the thing you need to know before you start is, am I going to be able to feed myself if I do this? The other reason that people tell me that they don't say anything about this is to do with their family and in particular their children. So lots of people have teenage children or early adult children who tell them that if they continue to say anything about this, they will be cut off. And I can't advise you to um, have anyone from your family cut you off, in particular your children. If it's somebody like your, you know, a sister you're not very fond of, your call <laughs> but don't don't get cut off from your children and if I can say something about talking to people who disagree with you on this it's not helpful to go in head first and it's not helpful to make it clear that you think they're idiots or that they are hateful or that they don't care about women's rights or they don't care about gay people or that they're sterilizing children even though frankly all of these things are consequences of this ideology People, you, you're putting somebody's back up saying this and you wouldn't like it yourself. You wouldn't like somebody coming in hard like this. And we know we don't like it because they're doing it to us. So if there's somebody that you very badly want to reach some sort of accommodation or truce with on this, for example, a child, then read up on negotiation theory. Um, the book I recommend is the first and best of the, the, it's the book that founded the whole negotiation theory as an academic discipline. It's a wonderful book called Getting to Yes. And it's full of um, excellent case studies and hints on all sorts of negotiations. I mean, it'd be helpful the next time you have to, do a, to look for a pay rise. Like this book is really worth reading anyway. But the sort of the, the takeaway hints from this point of view are, um, you know, be open ended. Ask what things mean to them. You have a position and they have a position. You're both of you going to have to just set your positions aside and start thinking about interests. So a position is something like if we take Northern Ireland as an example, um, I, no, underpinning your writing with research doesn't help to persuade anyone, I'm afraid, Patricia. Uh, it's, of course, a good thing to do, but um, figures don't persuade anybody, uh, unfortunately, Absolutely. not on something polarised like this. Everyone knows they think already and they just think, oh, those are lies. You know, and this figure, oh, this figure, you can prove anything with figures. They just discount everything. People change their minds because they've had time to think about things themselves and because they see somebody that they respect and they start to gradually see things differently themselves. That happens when you model respectful listening, when you ask them to explain 
what they think to you. When you ask genuine open-ended questions and, and really listen with your whole head and heart, then maybe they listen to you. Um, and then in the negotiating thing, what they say is abandoned positions. So if we think of Northern Ireland, one position would be one whole island and the other position would be Northern Ireland as part of the UK. Interests are things like, I deserve to live somewhere safe where my identity and my religion are fully respected in law and in everyday society. I need a school where my faith tradition is respected fully. So we need to move away at the country level from thinking about positions. Yes, my position is that trans women are men. That's a, my position. That's not relevant in lawmaking. In lawmaking, the position is, or should be, what do female people need to live healthy, safe, fully actualized lives? What do trans identified people need to live fully healthy, safe, actualized lives, et cetera, et cetera? How can we give both of these groups the things that they need? And, um, you know, when you start talking like that to people, you can perform miracles, as Northern Ireland proved until the Brexiteers came along and wrecked it, um, or other places, or, you know, hostage negotiators, or companies that end up, um, you know, getting around incredible difficulties when they merge. Um, I hope some of that's helpful. It's maybe a bit um, far from the coal face if anyone here has a trans-identified child. I really don't want to talk like this is easy. No, that's really great. And, and the reference to getting to yes is in your book I, I, yes. I saw it already. it's really great um, and I'm, I made notes of those because I know I'm going to have those conversations um we've got a question I know you've got to go soon but uh, we've got a couple of questions Iris says um the, we know that there's lots of copies have been sent out to uh influential people um have you had any direct feedback yeah, I have. Um, I've been in and out a bit into um, the House of Commons and the House of Lords, and I have had people say to me, oh, my God, you know, I got it from Sex Matters and I've read it and this is serious. And there have been some really, really important people I know have read it and are trying to decide what they need to do about it. So if anyone here funded one of those copies, I mean, you know, thank you very much. It was actually a very influential campaign. And, you know, I think there were I think there were people who perhaps didn't quite get their copy because perhaps the staff in their constituency office didn't quite understand what they were meant to be doing with it. But now people know they're meant to have received it. I've also had MPs say to me, I didn't get my copy. Uh, somehow it didn't turn up. And, you know, I've looked into it and I think I know who threw it out and I've just given them another copy. So, you know, we're getting there. We're getting there one lawmaker at a time. That's pretty good news, yeah. And, and not just lawmakers as well. There, there are lawyers and, uh, you know, influential people like that. Um, another question from Nigel. Um, Canada didn't have the, the Jim Crow laws that America had, and yet they're all over it. Um, well, how do you explain that? Do you know? Yes, that's a good question. I mean, to me, Canada is like blue America without red America to balance it at all. <laughs> like Canada, Canada is just like the Democrats around everything. And I mean, I, I, I'm not actually aligned in American politics. I'm really not. I mean, obviously, I did not think much of Donald Trump. But just generally speaking, if we move away from recent leaders, I wouldn't regard myself as a natural Democrat or a natural Republican. They both had their points, you know, um, but not in Canada. Canada's just like the Democrats ran the whole thing. And so it just went mad, basically. And they also have this extraordinary habit of virtue signaling. They like to think of themselves as much better than Americans. This is very much a problem in Ireland as well. Like we went for self ID <laughs> and I'm sure it was to own the Brits. Yes, like to overtake them in one step. It's so bad being a virtue signaling country. Um, we've got another comment that uh, Lorraine Kelly, uh, some sort of, uh, there's, a, there's a, a clip from MSN about Lorraine Kelly being praised for calling out presumably Kathleen Stock. Um, and uh, you'd be great on there with her, Helen, says Debbie, <laughs> to help to educate Lorraine. I'd love to. Lorraine, Lorraine, I think, is one of the quite large number of people in the media who has a true, genuine, close trans friend. I'm speculating on Lorraine, but I know this is a fact for yes. some of the people who are the biggest problems in the media. And they are unable to lose sight of that one person when they're thinking about the whole way that we organise society. That's why it's not about the individual. It's about the whole ideology. Yeah. Um, and Glasgow Quine, brilliant uh, person here, says, um, my copy went to... Patrick Grady, don't know, and I've ha I have an ongoing conversation by email with him. I don't know who Patrick Grady is, but he's obviously significant. Um, well, so that's, that's brilliant. Good. Well done, Glasgow Quine. That's really great. Um, but look, uh, we haven't got much more time now, and I, I know we've got to leave. So I'd like to say thank you to everybody for the questions. 
and thank you for the comments that you've been putting on through. I know you've been seeing the Helen as well as the rest of us. Um, thanks to all of you for joining us in this conversation. Um, I, I should like to thank you for your comprehensive account of the development of the identitarian gender ideology. It's really great because it goes right from first, first beginnings and, and historical uh, facts and, and brings it right up to date. Members of the audience may know your website is thehelenjoyce.com, and that's where your rebuttal of the smear campaign can be found. And our next talk is on Monday the 13th of December, when I hope to be talking to some writers and artists whose livelihoods have been targeted by opponents, so that they will be able to speak to us about this very same phenomenon. Everybody just do look out for the announcement, or alternatively sign up to our website, liberalvoiceforwomen.org, and we'll send you the invitation as soon as it comes out. We also want to hear from you with any policy related issues or problems that you want us to raise. And please, if you're at all liberal minded, please join or stay in the party so that we can get a better balance within our party. There's lots of work to be done, not just in ours. I have to say, all the parties told us at Philia, all the parties are affected by this, not, you know, not just ours. So stay in and hang on as much as you can. Join us and we'll give you a little bit of moral support as well and reasons to, to stay in. Thanks to Anna, to our technical staff and our organisers. Thanks to all of you for being part of a really fascinating evening. And most of all to our speaker, Helen Joyce, for an exhilarating evening examining a disturbing phenomenon. Thank you so much, Helen. But well, now, thank you, you Alison. Gotta, you've got to go, but we're going to stay on the Zoom for a short after party again. You're all welcome to stay. <laughs> You'd be more than welcome to stay if you. I have actually to got to go, but and thank you. So uh, the, we ask those of you, those of you who do, to turn on your cameras so that we can all see each other, please. And once again, thanks very much, Helen. Hope to see you again in the future. Thank you all. Bye. Take have a lovely care. party. I hope you're all pouring drinks now. <laughs> thank you so much. <laughs>